Hello everyone. We have discussed the average amount of sun radiation that the Earth system receives and absorbs. However, we all know that the amount of radiation that it receives varies by latitude and the amount it absorbs varies even more. Let's explore the impact of this differential heating visually. As we are after high level results, we will get rid of the meridians and let's increase the granularity of the latitudinal lines. And let's focus on this planar view. Ignoring the complexities due to factors such as the axial tilt and the seasonal variations, the Earth system on average absorbs more energy at the equator than at the poles. The average temperature is higher in the equatorial region, so it also emits more energy in the equatorial region than in higher latitudes, though the variation, as you can see, is not as big. A simple explanation is, whilst there is a significant difference in the temperature across latitudes when measured in degrees centigrade, which is a scale that is relevant to the models like us, but physics works on Kelvin scale in terms of which the difference between the equator and the poles is not as significant. Let's determine the net energy. In the top region, the Earth system emits more than it absorbs, which is easy to see if we place the absorbed energy on top of the emitted energy. So the net is negative. Same goes for the southern side. Around the equator, it absorbs more than it emits, so we can move the emitted bars to the right hand side to calculate the net transfer. We see the net transfer of energy is positive. Nature will try to bring equilibrium by setting in motion what it can. Most of this transfer happens via combination of circulation in the atmosphere and the ocean. These circulations transport heat, momentum and the constituent of the air and ocean. In this video, we will focus on the general circulation in the atmosphere. We will leave the ocean to another video. The atmospheric circulation is quite complex. One needs advanced training in fluid dynamics as well as other subjects such as chemistry, physics, etc. to understand the details and then supercomputers to model it. And even after all of that, one can only hope that the efforts will produce a reasonably accurate prediction for five to seven days. However, there are some general patterns which we aim to cover in this video. Future videos will cover more advanced topics. So let's begin. The warm air in the equatorial region rises. It's very moist and very unstable and only becomes stable near the top of the troposphere. It then turns sideways to the north and to the south. It cools and compresses and sinks towards the surface. This sinking air is very dry and that's why you see the major deserts around this region. It then turns towards the equator and you have one circulation cell known as Hadley cell. Hadley actually hypothesized that this cell goes from the equator to the poles but that can't be the case in the presence of a force called the Coriolis force which is a force induced by the rotation of the earth and causes a moving objects to move to the right or to the left depending on which atmosphere the object is moving latitudinally. It's not obvious in the current view but will be easier to see from the top view. The air when travelling in the northern hemisphere tilts to the right and it tilts to the left in the southern hemisphere. Let's draw them again. At the top, as the air moves away from the equator, it moves to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the lower hemisphere. 
Same happens to the moving air along the surface. The parts are not really straight but will be curved so they might look something like this. Let's get back to the previous view but keep in mind that this left and right movement will happen in other cells we are going to discuss later. Also note that we have shown one column but this circulation happens across the longitudes though there are variations for example caused by the differences in the land and ocean covers. The movement along the surface is quite important for shifting so let's draw how the wind will look like close to the surface. You can see northeasterly winds in the northern hemisphere and southeasterly winds in the southern hemisphere. These winds were utilized by ships when on their westward journey to the Americas. These are called trade winds. Some would say this is because these were utilized for trade purposes. But others say this is because the trade word has another meaning in the sense of habit. And these winds being steady were named trade winds in this historical sense of the word trade. And as mentioned before, the tracks of these winds will not be straight lines but curves so something like this. Next to the headly cells are the feral cells. They are also called indirect cells because the circulation is in the reverse direction. In fact, the general agreement is the circulation in these cells is induced by the circulation in the headly cells and its siblings in the polar region which we shall see in a moment. Imagine next to the sinking column of Hadley cells another sinking column. The air then reaches surface and turns poleward. It of course will turn to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. It then rises next to the rising column of the polar region which we haven't drawn yet and then turns back to the equator to meet the headleys. The resulting front generates the subtropical jet streams whose path we shall see later on. The day-to-day -day circulation patterns in this mid-latitude region don't look much like what we see here though. The circulation in the feral sense happens only when the conditions are right, like when the temperature gradient is not too big and the winds are not too strong. What rule this region are the eddies which are like trains of low and high pressure systems and transport warm air towards the poles and cool air towards the equator horizontally as opposed to vertically. Eddies are formed when cold and hot fronts meet and can be quite variable. The polar region is easy now. Its rising column is next to the feral rising column. Near the tropopause it turns poleward and then sinks towards the surface and the air then returns along the surface to complete the cycle. The polar circulation is the weakest and as you can see the shortest. There is a similar circulation in the south pole as well which we don't show to avoid clutter. And actually, as we know, the tropopause height is higher at the equator, so the circulation will look something like this. You can see the Hadley cells are the largest. There are also some circulation patterns resulting from the differences in the land ocean cover. For example, the Walker circulation in the Pacific and the monsoon system. There are also some recurring but irregular changes which are called oscillations such as El Nino and North Atlantic oscillations which lead to some peculiar weather phenomena which you should look up. And finally, as alluded to earlier, the four places at the top where the fronts meet produce jet streams. The shapes look weird, this is because of the height. We haven't drawn the atmosphere to scale because it's so thin so let's decrease the height. These streams flow from west to east. Their locations and shapes change over time. Sometimes they disappear at places only to reappear. 
the top and the bottom jet streams are the polar jet streams. The top one can attain speed up like 400 km per hour. The middle ones are called the subtropical jet streams. Changes in the tracks of these jet streams can have significant impact on the weather system. Many flooding and heat waves events are usually attributed to the changes in these jet streams. And just like the ships try to take advantage of the surface winds, aeroplanes try to take advantage of these high altitude winds to enjoy tailwind. We will leave you in the flight mode. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.